BirdLife South Africa is a conservation organization that relies on sound science. We rely heavily on collaboration and the productivity of various research institutions around South Africa to inform our conservation efforts. One such lab is based at WITS and is led by Dr. Siobhan Reynolds, who affectionately calls it the Things with Wings Lab. Siobhan and some of her students will present their work and we trust that you will both learn from it and enjoy it. Hello everyone, I hope you're enjoying the bird fair so far. I'm Dr. Siobhan Reynolds and thank you for joining my lab group, the Things with Wings crew, as we walk you through some of the exciting and important research we've currently been working on. Our group is based at the Animal, Plants and Environmental Sciences School at the University of the Witwatersrand in Johannesburg, but we maintain strong collaborations and ties with researchers at the Percy Fitzpatrick Institute of African Ornithology, and several of the talks today are actually also supervised by Professor Arjun Amar, who is based at the Fitzinstitute. Our work is typically focused on patterns at broad scales, scales, whether this be across entire cityscapes or at regional and national extents. We are generally interested in how landscape patterns at large scales are affecting our important biodiversity. We like to work at these large scales because they are vital in aiding decision makers and in informing relevant policy. To date, we have tackled a range of issues across the major drivers of biodiversity loss, this includes aspects of urbanization, agricultural intensification, climate change, environmental pollutants, as well as invasive species. Citizen science is a huge theme for us, whether that be using existing platforms such as the SAB app or iNaturalist, or even creating our own. Several of the talks today leverage citizen science data from the SAFRING and SABAP databases, and we are so grateful for all of the atlases and listers and ringers out there that generated those data. Without these large and spatially extensive data, we would not have been able to ask some of the important questions we have asked so far. Please keep these data coming. Your data are incredibly valuable for science. We also have a strong focus on open access and open science. So we like to use data that's freely available to the general public to ask our questions. We also like to use open access tools to create our own open access products that we can use to monitor and track changes in real time. So here is an example of an urban landscape that is changing through time. Um, and these data are accessed through the, Google, the cloud computing platform, Google Earth Engine. We then like to make our own products freely available to the public so that the whole open science theme repeats itself. We have a very productive lab and I'm really proud of some of our outputs so far. We generally tend to focus on birds um, as we like to use these indicators to test our ideas um, most frequently. For example, we've done a lot of work on this idea of the luxury effect, which says that people in low income landscapes typically have lower access to biodiversity. We've tested this effect across many different scales in South Africa, so at the city scale and at the national extent, and you're going to hear a lot more about this luxury effect in the coming talks. But we're also working on other really important themes. Joseph White, who's a postdoc in my lab, recently published a paper showing how woody plant encroachment is affecting low-income households across the whole of South Africa. PhD student Jeetan Singh also published the first national extent um, map of water hyacinth, which allows water managers to track their own water bodies and the spread of this invasive in real time. But not to worry, all of the talks today will be bird themed. This is a bird fair, of course. First up, Dr. Caroline Howes will talk to you about her exciting luxury effect work that she has been undertaking in the city of Johannesburg. This will be followed by honours candidate Sage Naidu, who will tell us how Sparrow's body plans might be changing in response to urbanisation. Dr Joseph White will detail how South Africa's bird populations are responding to woody plant encroachment. And this will be followed by honours candidate Christopher Shortland talking to us about how he is trying to create indicators of population trends for all of South Africa's biomes. <laughs> 
Last up, we have PhD candidate Kenan Padiachi, who will tell us about his global analysis of DDT monitoring in raptors. Thank you for attending today's session. We really hope that you enjoy it. Please reach out to me at my email address if you have any questions or would like to become involved in our group. Hello all, my name is Dr. Caroline Howes and I'm here to talk about my previous VITS postdoc looking at birds and biodiversity access in Johannesburg's urban green spaces. So the reason we care about this is because urbanization is a huge global trend. More and more people are moving to cities and currently already half of the population globally lives in cities. And this is happening particularly quickly in the developing world or the global south, so to speak, which means that by 2050, two thirds of developing world citizens will be urban which is equivalent to about 5 billion people. And of course, these, this urbanization trend comes with a lot of environmental changes that can be hard on both people and animals. So things like more paved land, the urban heat island effect, making cities much warmer than the surrounding area, air pollution and noise pollution, modification of waterways, and of course, also introduction of exotic species. But the UN believes that there is a better way forward for urbanization. Um, as part of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which is a call to action by all UN countries to promote prosperity and to protect the planet, they included goal 11, which is sustainable cities and communities. And this includes a whole bunch of provisions, such as to improve efforts to protect natural heritage in cities, to reduce the adverse effects of cities for its residents. And the one that we are most interested in in this research is to provide safe, inclusive, and accessible green spaces. So what exactly is a green space? We're defining it as any vegetated area, so any green area within an urban matrix. So this includes everything from backyards to golf courses to nature reserves. And there's a lot of importance to these urban green spaces and a lot of positive effects. They provide both recreational spaces and areas to conserve natural resources. They're really aesthetically appealing and beautiful. We also see reduction in chronic disease rates in areas that have urban green spaces and an improvement of mental health overall for the communities. And this may be particularly important for vulnerable populations who may not have private green spaces and gardens of their own. But sadly, not all green spaces are created equal and residents of lower income neighborhoods tend to live further from green spaces, have reduced size of green space in their neighborhoods and have reduced green space quality, which means reduced maintenance and fewer features such as fountains or trails or playgrounds or interpretive signage, etc. One aspect of green space quality is biodiversity, and this has been documented in the luxury effect. So there's a strong relationship between neighborhood wealth and biodiversity, and plant and animal diversity tends to be greatest in higher income neighborhoods. So this is because income leads to a greater investment in green spaces, tree planting, water features, etc. And these investments in turn lead to a higher diversity of birds, butterflies, lizards, and plants. Now, of course, income is just one piece of this equation. There are other predictors to urban biodiversity, so surrounding tree cover, paved cover, um, presence of water, etc. The vast majority of research on the luxury effect currently comes from the Northern Hemisphere, particularly Europe and North America, and there's very little research so far in Africa. Only five out of 147 studies were conducted in Africa. But the truth is, a lot of African cities do not look like Northern Hemisphere cities. Johannesburg certainly does not. To begin with, bird diversity is much higher in Johannesburg than in most global North cities. So almost 400 species recorded in the municipality. There's also extremely high income inequality and therefore a very long socioeconomic gradient. Additionally, Johannesburg is the second largest city in the world that is not located on a major water body, uh, which is extremely unusual, of course. 
And then historically, Johannesburg was a grassland, not a forest, as is typical across of much of Europe and North America. And these four factors really make it the perfect laboratory, so to speak, for, for the luxury. So here's what we wanted to learn about this incredible city. We really had two major questions. The first is, is there a luxury effect on bird diversity in Joburg's green spaces? So do income and, and urbanization affect bird diversity in the parks? And the second was, are other landscape or ecological predictors such as park size, surrounding tree cover, natural land, or wetland connectivity affecting bird diversity in these urban green spaces? So how did we go about figuring this out? To begin with, we chose a whole bunch of green spaces in Johannesburg, a total of 27. We tried to choose a huge variety of sizes, locations, types, etc., all over the city. We went out and counted the birds or surveyed them in these green spaces at a whole bunch of points. And then we used models to determine which variables were best predicting bird diversity in these green spaces. And this included extracting a whole bunch of variables surrounding income and ecological variables for each of the parks. So these are the parks we ended up selecting. Uh, most of the city's parks are managed by Joburg City Parks. They own a huge amount of land, about 5% of the total municipality. And we ended up with 29, as I said above. The green ones are natural spaces and the yellow are more manicured spaces such as Delta Park or Amarantia Dam. Uh, to give a little sense of where everything is, that's the CBD of Johannesburg. Down in the southwest, we have Soweto. Out west, we have Rotoput. In the east, there is Alex. And our furthest north reaches were up into Midrand. And we counted a lot of birds. and quite a high diversity, so about 7,000 individual birds of 150 different species. And the common species were much what you'd expect. So the most common species were our friend, the Southern Mast Weaver. We counted over 800 individuals out of those 7,000 birds, followed by dark cap bulbul, our noisy friend, the tawny flanked prinia, the one invasive in the top five, which is common mina, and our great urban adapter, the African palm swift. But how does this bird species richness connect back to income? And what does income look like across the city? So these blue squares surround the parks with the wealthiest neighborhoods surrounding them. They're primarily in the north and the median income is almost half a million rand per household per year. So quite up there. The orange squares are surrounding the parks in the lowest income neighborhoods. So you can see they're scattered all over the city. And these have about 29,000 rand per household per year. And that's equivalent to only 1 16th of those super wealthy neighborhoods. And when we start to connect this back to birds, here's what we find. So these two graphs, the top is showing richness, so number of species per point count, and the bottom is diversity per point count. Uh, diversity measures not only the number of species, but also evenness, but I'm not gonna get too technical into that. And then we have our parks listed across the bottom there. And what we can see is that the blue wealthy parks are really spread across the board in terms of richness and diversity, right from the very top to the very bottom. Whereas the orange parks, so these lower income neighborhood parks, have are all in the top half of, of the highest species richness. So what does this actually mean? So the previous graph gives a hint, but what is the story with regards to income? So when we looked at our three variables of income, urbanization, and the interaction between the two, which I'm not going to get too into, we found absolutely no effect of any of them on richness or diversity. So of course, then our next step was, if it's not the luxury effect, then what is going on? What are the landscape drivers here of bird diversity? We checked on park size, tree cover in the surrounding area, surrounding natural cover, and then wetland connectivity. We found absolutely no effect on park of park size or tree cover, but we found a negative effect of natural land cover, meaning more surrounding natural land means reduced species richness or a decrease in the number of species. 
and a positive effect of wetland connectivity, meaning more connected wetlands surrounding the parks leads to greater bird diversity and richness. So based on these results, we have two big questions. And the first is why would natural land have such a negative effect? The first is just the story of there's low bird diversity in high felt grasslands in these natural habitats. And these species tend to be very specialist and unlikely to move into parks. The second is a mix of habitats tends to have higher biodiversity than a large amount of the single type of habitat. So what this means is if we just have grassland but we have a huge amount of natural land cover surrounding a park, we're likely to get some of our familiar grassland friends, pied starling, swains and swirfell. Also, if we have just suburban land cover, we're likely to get another single suite of birds. So this is black collared barbet or violet uh, green wood hoopoe. But if we have a mix of habitats surrounding, then we're likely to get both, which results in higher bird diversity overall. So the second big question is, why is there no luxury effect um, in such a socioeconomically divided city? And the first part of that is tree cover, which is often associated with the luxury effect, does not affect bird diversity in green spaces at all. So that removes one big piece from the equation. But the second part we think has to do with wetlands. So we found a very strong relationship between urban cover and wetlands surrounding parks. So just to give a sense of what that looks like, here's Soweto, uh, very densely urban, but you can see that there are all these wetlands just um, snaking through the suburb. And you can see that those parks as well were all in the top quarter of diversity, um, which is pretty amazing. So what we basically think is happening is that wetlands are buffering low biodiversity in these very urban neighborhoods. So lower income neighborhoods are often associated with wetlands in Johannesburg because of historical planning decisions during the apartheid era where wetlands were used to separate racial groups. And because these low income neighborhoods are associated with these wetlands, the wetlands are buffering them from lower bird diversity, which is quite a cool phenomenon. So it's great to have biodiversity for biodiversity's sake, but from a human health and quality of life perspective, what does this actually mean? So we took it one step further and started looking at ecosystem services. Birds provide numerous services, um, things like pest control of mice and insects. They pollinate flowers and disperse seeds. And then perhaps most important in an urban context is that they provide cultural ecosystem services. So these are things like aesthetic enjoyment, we like watching them, um, or legends and traditions and seeing those birds associated with this is really special. So we assign birds traits representing, representing these services. And we looked at the same socioeconomic and ecological drivers as we did for diversity. I'm not gonna get too technical into the models, but just to give an idea, on the vertical, we have bird traits. So we have mass, whether they're cavity nesters, frugivores, nectivores, um, color, how colorful they are. And then across on the horizontal axis, we have green space traits. So park size, median income surrounding it, urban cover, tree cover, et cetera. And I'm just gonna highlight a few of the things I think are most interesting. I should also mention, of course, that the red squares mean that there is a positive association and the blue mean there is a negative association. So what we have here for our first one is that more tree cover surrounding a green space means that they're more likely to be frugivore or fruit eating birds in that green space. So this is not surprising because we often like to plant trees that have a lot of fruit that birds like, things like mulberries, lantana, syringa, camphor berries etc. And so these birds have adapted well to that situation. The negative part of this is that it may actually be a disservice because they are spreading invasive species. The next one here is just a quick one. Higher income neighbors have more, higher income neighborhoods surrounding parks means more nectivore birds, so more pollinators potentially. And this is likely just because there are more flowering plants in wealthy private gardens than in lower income neighborhoods. And then lastly, we found this really interesting trend that is essentially 
more interesting birds are found in lower income parks. So what we mean by more interesting is we created an index based on um, how much internet traffic there were for certain species and higher traffic meant more that they were a more interesting species. So this often means bigger, brighter birds, uh, migratory birds as well, things like bee eaters, honestly, even Egyptian geese are quite popular. Um, and this is a little bit of a bright spark that these culturally interesting birds are often found in lower income neighborhoods. So what does this all mean in the end? So the good news is bird diversity in parks across Johannesburg is not associated with wealth. There is no luxury effect, but some ecosystem services are associated with wealth. There's still reduced access to green spaces in lower income neighborhoods across South Africa. And there may well be other barriers such as safety or not having enough leisure time that may prevent people from using these spaces. So these are things that must be addressed in the future. Thank you for listening and thank you to all the amazing people and organizations that have helped me along the way. Good day. My name is Sage Naidu, and I'm an honors student with the University of the Witwatersrand in Dr. Siobhan Reynolds' lab. And today, I would like to introduce you to my study, Sparrows and the City, which focuses on the effects of urbanization on the morphometric responses of sparrows within South Africa. In this talk, I will specifically be focusing on the broad outline of the approach that we took as well as introducing you to some of our preliminary findings that we have thus far. Anthropogenic change and urbanization have altered the patterns and functioning of various ecosystems and ecosystem processes across the globe, affecting a broad diversity of organisms and species, including birds. For birds, some of the most influential impacts of these changes lie within the increased levels of urbanization and the associated increases in habitat fragmentation, increases in the diversity and introduction of new food resources, as well as alterations to predator-prey relationships, especially with the introduction of new predators in urban areas such as cats. As a result of this, various organisms have experienced changes to their biology and their morphology in order to cope with and adapt to these urban pressures. For birds, various studies have focused on the morphometric responses of birds to an increase in urbanization, where patterns have observed that generally, there's a decline associated with an increase in urbanization in body condition, body mass, and tarsus length whilst measures of wing cord length increase as urbanization increase. However, collectively, these morphometric responses have all been tied to an improvement in a bird's ability to better cope with and better adapt to these changing urban pressures. The problem with these morphometric responses, however, is that they pertain greatly to studies which were conducted within global north regions or global north countries with the general lack of literature on this topic having been produced in the Global South, including within South Africa. As a result of this, a general bias was highlighted where it was noted that the morphometric responses that are being presented in this literature pertain solely to Global North species, and these species responses are being taken as a universal response for all birds across the globe, in spite of the fact that this may not hold true. As such, it highlighted a need for similar research to be conducted in different regions of the world, specifically within the Global South, to determine whether or not these birds' Global North responses are being conserved or whether they differ between Global North and Global South regions. And South Africa serves as an optimal region to potentially start looking at such analyses specifically due to the fact that it has a pre-existing database known as SAFRING. SAFRING has, over several decades already, collected a wide diversity of, bird ring, of morphometric data through the process of bird ringing, which can be used to test the morphometric responses of a diverse range of species across South Africa's urban gradient to determine whether or not 
the morphometric responses of South African birds are the same or whether they differ from that of global north species. And so Sparrows and the City was born, where we will be looking at the morphometric responses of South African birds to determine whether or not it is the same or different from the global north responses. However, specifically, the study efforts of this research was focused on two broadly distributed sparrow species, namely the native Cape Sparrow, Passer melanurus, and its invasive congener, the house sparrow, Passer domesticus, two sparrow species which occur extensively across the regions of South Africa, occupying a diverse range of habitats ranging from highly urbanized to completely natural environments. Speaking of these diverse habitats, for this study, we specifically focused on the urban environments of South Africa in relation to its surrounding natural environments. And to identify this, we've used the South African land cover datasets for the years 1990 and 2020. The use of these two separate land cover datasets served as a mechanism to account for the fact that the morphometric data extracted from SAFRING spans a spatial scale of over 50 years. Hence, by using two separate data sets, it ensured that the urban land cover extracted is best representative of the period in which the birds were ringed. The morphometric data which we extracted from SAFRING pertain to measures of the body mass, tarsus length, wing cord length, as well as ratio indices of body condition that would be used to determine these sparrows' morphometric responses along South Africa's urban gradient. However, in addition to this, we incorporated environmental data extracted from Google Earth Engine's Terra Climate, which included measures of the minimum temperature, precipitation, and NDVI, to account for the fact that we needed an environmental control, as well as to account for the potential that there may be a potential stronger environmental influence on morphometric changes, in relation to the urban effect on morphometric responses between these two sparrow species. And moving forward, we will look at some of our preliminary results for the Cape and the House Sparrow, where specifically we are looking here at the effect of urbanization and, in the, and the environmental factors on the mass of each sparrow. The first observation that we made was that there is indeed a sex effect on the mass where in both the cape and the house sparrow, the mass of the male sparrows was higher than its female counterparts. Beyond this biological distinction, however, urbanization was confirmed to be influencing the mass of both species, where it was observed that an increase in the extent of urban land cover was associated with a decrease in the body mass in both the cape and the house sparrow, specifically observing a decrease of about one gram in the Cape Sparrow and about 0.75 grams in the House Sparrow along South Africa's urban gradient. In addition to this urban land cover effect, however, urban vegetation patterns were identified to influence the body mass of the sparrows, where in the Cape Sparrow it was found that both an increase in urban tree cover and an increase in urban grass cover was associated with an increase in the body mass of the sparrows of about 2 grams, However, in the house sparrow, it was observed that only urban tree cover affected the body mass, where an increase in urban tree cover was associated with a decrease in the body mass by about 0 0.75 grams. In line with this, it was also found that there is actually an environmental effect on the body mass of these two sparrow species, indicating that in spite of the urban effect, there is also an environmental influence on these uh, on these morphometric traits, where in the Cape Sparrow it was specifically found that an increase in precipitation was associated with a decrease in the body mass, whereas an increase in the measure of the NDVI and the minimum temperature were both associated with an increase in the body mass across South Africa. In the House Sparrow, however, it was found that only precipitation and minimum temperature affected the body mass, where an increase in both variables was correlated to a decrease in the, mod in the body mass for both, was associated with the decrease in the body mass. Going off from this, we can draw certain preliminary conclusions for this analysis, with the first being that uh, 
The morphometric responses do align with the global norm, where an increase in urbanization is indeed associated with the decrease in the body mass for these sparrows. In addition to this, the second conclusion which can be drawn currently is that the morphometric responses of the Cape and the house sparrow differ along South Africa's urban gradient, where certain traits are increasing or decreasing in response to different traits for the different species. And this may pertain to differences in the nature of these two species within South Africa, where the Cape Sparrow represents a native species and the house sparrow represents an invasive congener, indicating that this nature may influence the way that these sparrows respond to or exploit the urban environments of South Africa. Moving forward in the study, it is important to note that there is still a fair bit of work that needs to be done in terms of improving the analysis, as well as incorporating different or additional morphometric traits, including the tarsus link, wing cord length, and ratio indices of body condition to determine whether or not these morphometric responses are also similarly changing as observed in the global north, or if these traits differ in the within the Global South context. On that note, I would just like to thank you for listening to this presentation and to thank the Africa Bird Fair for giving me this opportunity. Furthermore, I would just like to thank all the people who are involved in this project in helping me to move forward and progress with the analysis, especially my project supervisor, Dr. Siobhan Reynolds. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kaelin Padiachi, and today I'll be discussing temporal and spatial patterns of organochlorine pesticide monitoring in raptors globally. This study forms part of a much larger project to understand how certain organochlorine pesticides have been monitored throughout the world using birds of prey. For this presentation, I wanted to summarize existing knowledge on one of the most destructive and possibly most extensively studied OCPs in history, DDT. Now, DDT is probably one of the most notorious pesticide compounds ever created. And while its destructive impact on wildlife may be common knowledge, the origin of this compound may not be. DDT was first synthesized in 1874 by Austrian graduate student Ottmar Zeidler. However, it was only much later, 1939, that the insecticidal properties of DDT were first discovered by Swiss-born chemist Paul Müller. This discovery coincided with the start of World War II providing for one of the most famous applications of DDT in history. The powerful insecticide was implemented to protect thousands of soldiers against vector-borne diseases, specifically typhus and malaria, a task at which DDT was historically successful. With the end of the war in 1945, DDT became widely available to the public as an agricultural pesticide. It was around this time that scientists started voicing their concerns about DDT, and its potential impact on the environment. But it was only around the early 1960s, with the publication of Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring in particular, that governments and the public started paying attention. So much so that from the 1970s, DDT became banned throughout most of the global north or the developed world. The United States banned it in 1970, with Britain and most of Europe following suit by the end of the 1980s. And then, of course, came the Stockholm Convention in 2004, restricting DDT and other OCPs in other parts of the world. But in 2006, the World Health Organization decided to support the reintroduction of DDT in particular in more tropical parts of the world in an effort to control malaria. Most, if not all, of these tropical countries where DDT has been reintroduced happen to be in the global south or the developing world. Now, from this timeline, we see that DDT in particular has long been impacting the environment, and its effects on organisms are well known. Most famously, DDT has been linked to the catastrophic decline in raptor populations across the globe. However, as several scientists have stated, it was in fact the combined impact of both DDT and another OCP listed by the Stockholm Convention, Dildrum, that actually led to the dramatic declines in northern raptor populations. DDT induced significant egg shell thinning, which resulted in reproductive failure. This reproductive failure was further exacerbated by mortality of adult birds due to dildrum contamination, which further depressed population growth and led to these significant declines in populations over time. 
While pre-1960s and 70s population data on many raptor species in relation to OCP contamination is limited, there are some indications from populations both during the time of DDT use as well as after subsequent bans and restrictions. A great example is the study by Helen Dedal on white-tailed sea eagles. They show that mean productivity in sea eagles increased as DDE concentrations in eggshells decreased between 1965 and 2005. This is just one of hundreds of published studies since scientists first started investigating OCPs in raptors. Individual studies like this, covering a limited geographic region and only a few species at a time, while valuable, provides equally limited data. Hence the need and importance to consolidate all that we have discovered over the decades. Such an abundance of data has the potential to provide a substantial understanding surrounding DDT contamination in global raptor populations over a considerable time period. However, to do so requires a formal, structured method that can summarize and synthesize what has already been done and discovered so far. So in order to do that, we conducted a systematic review to search for, gather and appraise relevant published studies on DDT and dieldrin in birds of prey from around the world. The aim of this review was quite simply to summarize and synthesize the monitoring effort of these compounds in global raptor populations, both over time and space. Our comprehensive search produced 481 potential studies. After reading the titles, we excluded 241 of them. We then read the abstracts of the remaining 240 studies and excluded a further 16. The remaining 224 studies were then included in the review, in which we found a further 32 studies cited that we also decided to include, leaving us with a total of 256 studies that actually met our inclusion criteria. These 256 studies were published between 1966 and 2020, providing data on DDT and or dieldrin in 27,563 raptors from 114 different species spanning over 115 years and coming from all continents except Antarctica. The first step was to understand which parts of the world were most represented by this vast amount of data. In other words, which continents and countries our studies focusing on the most. What we found were that raptors were collected from 48 different countries. However, most of these raptors were sampled from Europe and North America. That means that 95% of all raptors sampled for DDT and or dieldrin monitoring came from just Europe and North America. The remaining 5% of raptors were sampled from Africa, Asia, Oceania, and South America. However, the only countries representing Oceania were Australia and New Zealand, both of which are regarded as global north or developed countries. Furthermore, certain countries in Asia from which raptors were, were sampled are also regarded as global north, such as Japan, South Korea, and even Russia. So what this all means is that less than 5% of samples collected for DDT and dieldrin monitoring in raptors were sampled from the global south. We then decided to dig a little deeper to see if there was any bias at the species level. Yet again, we uncovered a considerable bias in sampling towards certain species. For example, although we recorded samples from 114 different species, the top three species, Eurasian Sparrowhawk, Bald Eagle, and Peregrine Falcon, alone made up 50% of all samples, with the 10 most sampled species accounting for 77% of all samples. Furthermore, of the three most sampled species, peregrine falcons were the only species found throughout all continents. However, they were still sampled far more in the global north than they were in the global south. The numbers in green represent birds sampled in global north countries in North America, Europe and Oceania, while those in red were sampled from global south countries in Africa, Asia and South America. We also found that most data on DDT and dieldrin monitoring in raptors comes from avian specialists. More diverse dietary guilds began being monitored in recent decades, with a greater proportion of samples coming from generalist species. But again, these avian specialists we know are dominated by peregrine falcons and Eurasian sparrowhawks, while the generalists are dominated by bald eagles, indicating quite a large bias towards a narrow range of species when monitoring these compounds in global raptors. After looking at species, 
we looked at tissue sampled and whether there has been a preference for certain tissues through time. We found that egg, liver and plasma comprised 84% of all tissue samples, with egg by far being the most sampled tissue globally. They were also the earliest tissue sampled and the only tissue to be sampled in all decades. Here you can see the number of samples collected in the top three countries from which most monitoring information on DDT and deodorant and raptors comes from. The United Kingdom seems to have been a major pioneer of diagnostic research in DDT and deodorant in raptors, with most samples collected before their respective bans. However, the high level of monitoring of raptors within the United States of America after their bans suggests that raptors are being used as sentinel species to monitor temporal trends of these compounds and to assess the effectiveness of the regulatory actions adopted. So from all this information and over 100 years of research and monitoring, what can we actually say about global monitoring effort of OCPs such as DDT and deodorant and raptors? Well, firstly, there is an undeniable bias in sampling of raptors for OCP analysis towards the global north, but specifically towards North America and Europe with less than 5% of samples coming from outside these continents. We also know that despite the wealth of samples collected, the raptors identified in our review represented only 21% of global raptor species. 50% of all those samples come from just three species. The geographical bias in monitoring of OCPs is concerning, since most, if not all countries, still using and or producing particularly DDT are in the undersampled global south. This suggests limited monitoring in countries where these compounds are still in use. Our finding that Africa, Asia and South America combined account for only 3% of all samples collected between the 1960s and 2010s, coupled with the continued use of these OCPs, further highlight the bias in DDT and deodorant monitoring information. It suggests that these compounds are still worthy of current concern in the global south a region which is home to most of the world's biodiversity. The lack of monitoring identified in this review presents an ongoing risk to global biodiversity in this region. While DDT may indeed be important for vector control to protect human health in many of these poorer regions, these findings support the importance of monitoring to inform effective and efficient contaminant management decisions for OCPs as well as other emerging POPs. So what's next for the study? Well, we're currently conducting a meta-analysis with the concentration data from all these studies to statistically assess changes in DDT and deodorant in global raptor populations over time. Smith conducted a similar exercise for human breast milk with very interesting results, and we aim to produce data similar to that study, quantifying DDT and deodorant concentrations over time and geographic location. And finally, we're making use of Amur falcon carcasses from a catastrophic die-off event that took place in 2019. This is meant to provide a more current assessment of OCPs and heavy metals in a migratory raptor species. This should shed some light on contamination of a species which occurs across both northern and southern hemispheres in countries currently using and or producing DDT in particular. And with that, I would like to thank all of you for attending and extend my gratitude and thanks to all the organizations and individuals that have made this study possible and continue to support this project. Hello everyone, my name is Chris Shortland and I'm currently an honors student this year at WITS. This year, I have gotten to work on a project that I've been incredibly excited about. It is titled, The State of South Africa's Birds, an analysis on the populations of South African bird species using the SABAP2 Citizen Science Project. The world finds itself on the precipice of change. Anthropogenic carbon dioxide emissions have risen exponentially in the past century. These are resulting in potentially irreversible shifts in the modern day climate. Paired with that, there has been massive amounts of land cover change occurring globally. These changes threaten natural ecosystems in a way that poses unique challenges for ecosystems to overcome. In the past 100 years, 200 species of vertebrates globally have gone extinct with the majority of these being attributed to humans in one way or another. These human impacts have been dubbed global change and directly threaten species through a number of changes to their habitats, either directly through land cover changes, fragmentation, or an overall reduction in size. But it can also change habitat through shifts where suitable climate for a specific habitat moves, forcing the dispersal of the species within.
Studies have shown that with increasing temperature globally, both the number of species as well as the remaining suitable area for those species will decline rapidly. Species are forced to adapt in a very short time span, or they are forced to disperse, which is not an inherent option for all species. Yet, as I've mentioned, climate change is only one aspect of global change, and there are a plethora of other factors that threaten birds, such as land cover change and invasive species. Land cover change is, an, is a factor that threatens many bird species, and is something that has occurred extensively in South Africa, primarily for the purposes of cultivation, forestry, and plantations. Pristine natural habitat, particularly in the Feinbos, forests along the eastern half of the country, and the grassland biomes, has seen large amounts of changes resulting in fragmentation and a reduction in the available habitat for this country's birds. Clearly, the scale of the problem is very large, and with so many species being potentially affected, resources need to be allocated efficiently in a way that is able to track how bird populations are faring over time. This is where traditional science may fall short. There are simply too many species for a small team of researchers to make individual observations themselves. So what is the solution? Well, it, it's you guys. Citizen science or the use of volunteer-based observations allows for a scope of research to increase to levels that would previously be thought impossible. And particularly within the field of ornithology, citizen science has seen a high adoption rate with projects such as eBird, Project Feeder Watch from Cornell University, and many other different surveys done by the British Trust of Ornithology. These projects have been put to great use globally in monitoring the trends of bird species over time. They have been used globally to show that the number of species in decline worldwide is ever-growing, or they have also been used on regional scales to show that species within smaller areas are also in desperate need of help. But what is happening in South Africa? Well, South Africa is fortunate to have a high number of citizen science programs, but arguably the, best, uh, the two best known ones are the Southern African Bird Atlas Project 1, which puts citizen science on the map within South Africa and Africa as a whole, and then its successor, the Southern African Bird Atlas Project 2, or SABAP 2, which is the main focus of my study. SABAP 2, which started in 2007 and is currently still ongoing, is an incredibly useful tool and to date has had over 17 million total observations and around 18,000 checklists submitted to it yearly. Over 150 publications have been made using SABAP2, but they all focus on a single or a small number of species, which is a gap that I really wanted to target. In that gap lies the crux of what I wanted to investigate. Why limit yourself to a small number of species when this incredible tool could be used to monitor all of South Africa's birds? So my goal was to detect the changes in the reporting rates, i.e. the number of times a species was seen in a pentad, versus the number of times it wasn't, of species using data gathered from SABAP2 over a 13 year period. Although the project has now been running for 15 years, including 2022, both 2007 and 2022 did not have enough data to reliably include them in the study. The important thing I wanted to accomplish was to create indicator species for the major biomes and habitats in South Africa to use the species trends as bio-indicators. This allowed me to not only get individual species trends, but also assess the well-being of the habitats that they are indicative of, which would provide a broader indication of which groups of species are most vulnerable. But which biomes were selected? A total of seven regions were investigated based on size and the type of birds that one might expect to occur there. These biomes were savanna, feinbos, grassland, karoo, forest, wetland, and coastal and indicator species needed to be selected that best represented them. Indicator species were selected using a mixture of quantitative and qualitative methods. For the large biomes such as savanna, feinbos, karoo and grasslands, pentads that occur within these regions are very likely to be dominated by a single habitat type. Therefore, pentads could be assigned to either be a savanna, feinbos, karoo or grassland pentad, and the SABAP data could be used to find species that occur primarily, i.e. greater than 90%, in pentads that are dominated by a single habitat type. These species could then be classified as an indicator for that region. This works great for large biomes, but for the smaller ones, namely forests, wetlands and the coast, there is no guarantee that a single pentad is, will be dominated by a single habitat, and any checklists submitted to SABAP for that pentad are sure to include many species that are not indicative of the intended habitat type. Thus, for these regions, a qualitative method involving my trusty Roberts guide was used to assign species as indicators. Finally, with all the prep done, the trends of the different species were modelled 
estimating changes in the reporting rate over time. Now we can move on to the meat of the project, the results. A total of 344 species were selected as indicator species across the different biomes. There were some differences that were immediately noticeable. For instance, when looking at the proportion of species showing a negative and positive trend, four habitats, forest, fynbos, grassland, and wetland, had a majority number of declining species, but forests were found to have the highest proportion of declining species. Interestingly, the Karoo had the highest proportion of increasing species. Moving on to the overall trends for the different biomes. The trends themselves may appear to be incredibly small, but it is important to note that within a biome, there are always winners and losers, and that the trends of species in decline may be offset by those that are increasing. We saw from the previous slide that the proportion of increasing versus decreasing species for all the biomes was around the 50% range. This would mean that half the species in a given habitat would be increasing, while the other half decreasing, leading to an overall trend that is rather small, but is indicative of whether or not the species that are decreasing are doing so at a higher rate than those that are increasing, and vice versa. Starting off with the coastal biome, there were a total of six indicator species that were selected, and uh, overall trend was net positive. Three of the species were found to be declining, uh, and those were bank cormorant, African oyster catcher, and ruddy turnstone. The forest biome, an area known for land cover change and plantations on the eastern coast of South Africa, had a total of 26 indicator species, with an incredibly small net positive trend, despite having the highest proportion of declining species. Of these species in decline, I've highlighted three that may be of particular notoriety, orange ground thrush, olive sunbird, and southern banded snake eagle. While these are only three of, it, of the declining species, the proportion of declining species relative to those that are increasing is much greater, and so there are many more declining species that I have not mentioned here. The Fynbos, or the Cape Floristic region, had a total of seven indicator species, and had a net negative trend. Of the four species found to be in decline, all were endemic to South Africa. These species were the Cape Sugarbird, Orange-Breasted Sunbird, Protea Canary, and Cape Siskin. This region has particular importance due to the high amount of endemism within the region, and the negative trend that the birds are showing is likely indicative of a greater change within the region. 39 species were identified as indicators for the grassland biome, and overall there was a net negative trend with Amma falcon, blue corhan, and African grass owl being potentially the most recognisable species in decline. Notably, maybe the most recognisable species in decline for the grassland biome, the white-winged flufftail was not included in this study due to a lack of data within the SABAP database for this species. However, these four species are likely indicative of greater changes happening within the grassland biome uh, as a result of agriculture or climate change or a number of other factors that have not been considered. This shows that potentially more action should be taken within the grassland biome to ensure that the species within this area have adequate protection. Only five species were labelled as indicators for the Karoo, but overall there was a net positive trend. The only two species that were found to be in decline were the Karoo Korhan and the Red Lark. The savannah biome had the largest group of indicators, with 188 species being identified as savannah species. Around 100 of those species were found to be in decline, and so it was difficult to narrow down just a few to share, but the two vultures included in the data set, white-headed vulture and lapid-faced vulture, as well as then grey-headed kingfisher were some of them. Overall, savanna species showed to have a net negative trend. Finally, the wetland biome was identified to have a total of 65 indicator species, and despite having a majority number of declining species, there was an overall increasing trend for the biome. However, of the declining species, marsh owl, African finfoot, and six different duck species were identified. Wetlands are integral to the functioning of South Africa's ecosystems, and despite the overall increasing trend, the majority number of declining species within this biome likely indicate that our wetlands are under threat, and more research really should be done to ensure that uh, adequate protection and management is done for our wetlands. These results have highlighted a number of key regions that are showing signs of decline, such as grasslands and the fynbos, that have net negative trends that are quite large but it also shows areas that may appear to have minimal overall changes to their bird populations, but have high proportions of declining species, such as wetlands and forests.
It also highlights the potential of SABAP2 and the use of it for wide-scale monitoring in South Africa. I certainly am looking forward to using it more in the future and to expand on the work that I've already done so far. I would like to thank everyone for listening to what I've had to share, but more importantly, I would like to thank all contributors to the SABAP2 dataset. Without your effort, research like this would not be possible. And if you're not already an Atlaser, I suggest you try it. It's not just fun, but it clearly has a purpose. Hi everyone, my name is uh, Joseph White. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the University of the Witwatersrand Strand in Johannesburg. And at this African Bird Fair, I'll be presenting to you some of my work uh, with a bunch of collaborators based in Siobhan Reynolds' lab, uh, looking at the impacts of woody plant encroachment on birds, but as well as people. So woody plant encroachment has been this trend across much of uh, the world, uh, the world's open ecosystems, where we shifted from these uh, relatively open uh, sparse grasslands to areas with a much denser covering of woody plants. And in South Africa, we've seen this both across our relatively dry grassland savanna regions, as well as our more mesic wet regions. And some of these brilliant repeat photographs from Tim Hoffman's team showing this uh, really, really clearly. These great photographs from James Patrick and others. So this trend has been uh, fairly persistent and ongoing throughout Sub-Saharan Africa. And taking a closer look at South Africa and this two and Espertini's grasslands where my uh, work has kind of been focused, uh, you can see that there's been an overall increasing trend in woody cover and woody plant encroachment trend over the vast majority of this region. So woody plant encroachment has the ability to shift ecosystems uh, ability to try and provide ecosystem services, as well as maintain their biodiversity. And those are the two kind of topics um, in terms of people as well as birds that I'll go into more detail about now. So let's first start off with the impact of encroachment on people and ecosystem services. So this is a kind of normal expected timeline in an encroached uh, kind of open grassland or open savanna. But uh, over time, we expect this shift from a kind of grassy cover, vegetation cover, to a far more woody vegetation cover. And then we can try and conceptualize how this might impact different uh, ecosystem services. And in this case, I'd like particularly at provisioning ecosystem services. So those include uh, things that um, can be directly kind of accessed from the environments around you. And the ones that we've used in this analysis and um, in this project are uh, looking at the capacity of grazing forage and um, the, well, the amount of people that uh, use the environment around them for uh, grazing forage as well as collecting their own wood as well as collecting their own water and the kind of direction of response that we'd expect from these different provisioning ecosystem services in a landscape that's slowly being approached would be a slow reduction uh, first in the amount of grazing forage, as we end up being in a much more kind of shrub or woody uh, dominated ecosystem state. Whereas we expect, um, and as well as expecting the amount of uh, water available to, de uh, to decline, uh, this is because uh, these trees and woody plants tend to uh, use more water, and it means that there's less infiltration and uh, less overall runoff and access to kind of water sources. And then we expect an increase in the amount of wood available for those that are collecting wood directly from the environment around it. Although we expect a bit of kind of a range here, and this depends on the localized context on whether they're, uh, what species might be um, in each of these kind of environments across the country. So that's kind of our conceptual framework of how we expect different ecosystem services to be uh, provisioning in particular to be impacted by woody plants and clergymen. So we did this analysis at a municipal scale across the country. So we first um, used all these brilliant remote sense data sets that I showed you a bit earlier, that larger image of Sub-Saharan Africa from uh, Zander Fenter and colleagues from 2018, where they're using satellites map the change in woody cover over a 30 year time period. So at the municipal scale, this is essentially what it looks like, where we have far more woody cover um, along our more kind of savanna regions and um, the east coast of the country, and far less woody cover um, in our more grassland areas, kind of the central, uh, the central high fault. 
And in terms of woody cover change, we see that predominantly along kind of the Drakensberg foothills along here and central regions, as well as uh, parts of Limpopo are experiencing high rates of woody cover change, up to, in some cases, 1% per year. And this is essentially the relationship between woody cover change and woody cover. This tends to be a relatively rapid increase when you have uh, these low levels of woody cover. Um, and this peaks around somewhere around 36%, uh, that rate of change. That's, it's, it's greater sort of about uh, 30% um, or 35 to 40%. Obviously, you have a slow increase once you already have a lot of woody cover in that space. And what we did was we tried to look at the relationship between these woody cover change variables as well as an overall variable for the use of ecosystem services that includes uh, the access to grass forage, uh, wood collection, as well as uh, water collection. I'm trying to look at this relationship to basically the overall uh, average income per municipality. And you can immediately see that areas that tend to be using um, more ecosystem services around them tend to have uh, be on the lower end of the kind of the income scale. And if you look at these variables together, it's to be expected those communities that are essentially more nature reliant, those with a high ecosystem service use tend to have much lower incomes. Once you have a higher income, you have uh, less of a direct requirement uh, for uh, provision ecosystem services uh, from the environment around you. So we, we ran a model and try to uh, understand how these variables are interacting with one another. So first we take a look at uh, the relationship between income, woody cover and woody cover change. And what we find is at this point over here, so the highest point of this peak where we have the greatest woody cover change, um, that tends to be correlated with areas with low woody cover and low incomes. So low income areas are experiencing the highest rates of woody cover change. And this tends to be in areas like open grasslands where things are already, um, where things are already uh, well, tend to start from a low starting point in terms of woody cover. We then look at uh, provision ecosystem services. And as expected from that previous figure that I showed, uh, those uh, areas, again, that have a low woody cover um, and a high requirement of provision ecosystem services tend to have the highest rates of woody cover change. So the messages from this are essentially that uh, encroachment tends to be greater to municipalities with low income and a high reliance on provision ecosystem services. And essentially, if encroachment continues and we have that expected conceptual uh, response of these uh, ecosystem services to increases in woody cover, so a decrease in the amount of grass forage and a decrease in the amount of water available, then we can expect that these communities will be further pushed into a poverty trap where they have, don't have access to these uh, resources around them as the environment around them slowly changes. And that's obviously something of great concern. And we went a, bit, a step further to try and identify where these municipalities may be and try and create like a spatial framework, essentially. And these two maps essentially show that uh, the municipalities highlighted with the, um, the white outline essentially show these municipalities of concern and where we can focus more of our attention. So these are municipalities that have a greater woody cover change and less income. Those are shown in purple. So these are, um, municipalities that we identify that are, uh, should much require kind of government intervention or consultation at least. And then we also try to work out uh, kind of benefits or, or costs to, um, uh, in terms of ecosystem services. And what we find is those with the greatest cost and the least amount of benefit, um, we can try and line those up as well and identify where these are going to be and essentially try and provide this to different government agencies to try and uh, focus and provide focus funds to these different municipalities. Okay, so let's move on to birds now. So let's take a look at the impacts of woody plant encroachment on Southern Africa's uh, different birds. So here's just a conceptual diagram to start us off again. So again, we have this x-axis of increase in encroachment. On the y-axis, we have the species richness, so the total number, of, like the biodiversity of these different types of birds. So first, we're starting off with our grassland specialist birds, and essentially, we're going to have the peak grassland specialist birds to be expected, where we have um, lower woody cover, and as woody cover increases, we expect an increase in the number of woody plant-dependent birds over our grassland specialist birds. So that essentially builds our framework and our understanding. We are going to, uh, if we have this encroachment 
uh, continued encroachment that we're probably going to be most concerned about our grassland specialist birds. So to try and understand these trends here, we took a look at the SABAP or we, we analyzed the SABAP to South African Bird Atlas Project Citizen Science Data, which is an amazing data set, which has uh, thousands and thousands of submitted cards from different bird atlases. It's really a magical data set. Um, it has uh, this full grid cell over uh, the country, as well as including different parts of Southern Africa, so Lesotho and Eswatini, where atlases are asked to record all species. I'm sure all of you know this. Uh, visit all habitats, uh, atlas for at least two hours, and try and focus your atlas in within good conditions. But to try to analyze this data, it requires a filtered sampling design to try and avoid the spatial temporal bias. So we see that there are a lot more cards um, being reported in areas of high kind of urban density, so close to kind of uh, metropolitan centers, as well as areas that are relatively nice to go to, like Kruger National Park, where we tend to have a lot of cards. And this means that we need to try and um, account for this, these hypersampled pentads. So the sampling design that we took here was obviously to try and focus just on the areas that are experiencing encroachment, that's our grassland and savanna biomes, as well as removing these overly developed pentads. Uh, there's a lot of development taking place. That's not really what we're looking at. And we then match the time period to um, the encroachment data set, the satellite data set we have, 2007 to 2016. So we looked at this over a 10 year period. We also then took a maximum of four cards per pentad per year to try and come up with the kind of matched um, sampling period for each pentad. We obviously didn't take a look at water birds. We're only interested in terrestrial birds here. And then we also removed very rare birds from our analysis. And overall, we ended up with about 268 birds to try and analyze over about 3,200 different pentads. And that's essentially the sampling design that we uh, ended up with in the bottom right-hand corner. So we ran a bunch of models to try and analyze the kind of trends over time and what's happening to these 268 different bird species. So let's first take a look at the occupancy trends. We overwhelmingly found many of these birds to have um, uh, decreasing occupancy trends. Often this was very subtle. So for example, this bird on the top, very subtle declines and still a very high occupancy. So that's not too much of a concern. But um, these trends, although subtle, um, are obviously concerning for the ones that are slightly more steeper. A lot of birds tend to be relatively stable, no clear occupancy trends over time. And then we found some species to be gradually increasing. So it's a short time period. You don't expect many drastic changes in that, but um, we managed to identify a few species that were either increasing or decreasing somewhat gradually or steeper in some cases. We then looked at the response of these birds to changes in woody cover. And we could then classify these either as birds that prefer these open habitats, so our kind of grassland specialists, um, and in this case, they have a negative response to woody cover, to increase in woody cover. So that tends to be kind of this area down here where they most favor um, conditions. Some birds with no clear response at all. And then a lot of birds that quite like woody cover. So you tend to find these birds starting off with a very low occupancy probability at low woody cover and then slowly increasing. So having a high probability of being found um, at greater woody cover. What we can then do is combine these two variables. So we can take a look at, look at the relationship to woody cover, as well as the trend in occupancy over time and create this kind of winner loses framework. So birds that uh, like woody cover and have a positive occupancy trend are likely to be winners in this scenario with increasing encroachment. And then the opposite holds true that those that prefer these open habitats and are declining over time are gonna be in trouble with increased encroachment. We can then map our species onto this and we can then identify are two different groups of uh, either our losers um, or our winners. And we find birds like our southern double colored sunbird, um, which quite likes woody environments and it has an increase in population trend that's likely to be one of our winners. Whereas our orange river Franklin tends to like these more open habitats and has a reported decline in occupancy over time. So that's a bit of a concern species if things continue as, new, as normal. So overall, we had 64 species that we considered losers in this case. It's concerning with only 12 winners, whereas the vast majority of species were in fact neutral and didn't have a clear response to the combination of, uh, of woody cover and the occupancy trend. So they're not a concern in terms of this right now, but some of them are, have declining occupancies, but that might likely be due to a different cause. We then try to understand why these species might be 
um, responding negatively to um, woody cover and try to identify different ecological strategies. And the one that came up most clearly was that species with a greater habitat breadth tended to be our winners. So they had a slightly better score on our winners losers gradient. So those are species like the alpine swift. Uh, it has a really broad range of habitats that can be found in. Obviously, it means it's slightly more um, resilient to change. There's lots of different habitats that it could easily um, uh, easily live in. Whereas our orange river franklin, unfortunately, has only a few different types of habitats that it would typically be found in, and is also found um, in the negative range of our wind and loser gradient. So that's going to be um, a species of concern. We can essentially use habitat breadth to try and understand um, the responses to woody cover um, changes, but most likely all sorts of different environmental changes as well. So it's a useful metric to try and identify species that we may be concerned about. So our key messages from our bird story are that we have found widespread but relatively subtle occupancy declines in Southern African birds. And that a business as usual um, approach for woody plant encroachment is likely to impact many of these red equal and birds. So we identified 64 potential losers, and mainly those that are going to be using a smaller range of habitats. So that's the end of my talk. Uh, I think I've tried to highlight as best as possible the concern around woody plant encroachment, both from a bird biodiversity approach as well as um, the impacts on ecosystem services. Uh, thank you for attending the African Bird Fair. And I hope you enjoy all the rest of the talks uh, uh, from our lab as well as from all the other talks. Thank you very much. Thank you to Siobhan, Joe, Sage, Chris, Caroline, and Kaylin for sharing your work and your expertise. It is so important that we keep producing top quality science in order to better understand and conserve our birds. We have a short break in the program now to allow you to explore the virtual platform. Make sure to place your bids on the many items within our silent auction and to visit our exhibitor and sponsor booths. You can also partake in our bird search game. All of these functions can be found on the left-hand side menu on the platform. If you cannot see this menu, Look for the three lines in the top left corner and click this to open the menu. See you back at 12 for live interviews with some of our special guests on Feeder One or a presentation on the Mouse Free Marion project on Feeder Two.